Okay, let's get started. This is not something I'm handing out right now. Sorry, I grabbed a copy of the exam from the steel design as opposed to the attendance sheet. And I'm sure some of you are like, <clears throat> you know, if you handed that out, that'd be all right. I don't think we'd be able to you know, have a problem with you handing that out an hour early. Um, okay, first off, um, quick announcements. Um, don't forget in here, we have a celebration next week on the 26th. We review on the 24th. So similar schedule as to what's going on in steel design this week, review on Monday, the same on Wednesday. Um, so be prepared to ask questions about the exam, so on and so forth. You have homework in here due on Friday. I know that many of you are also in steel design, and so you're like, okay, kind of hard to focus on what's going on in here when we celebrate in an hour. But um, because you have a homework on Friday, um, does anybody have any questions about it? Have you started it? I hope you've started it. It's not, it's not long, but it's not short either. Okay, so everybody good? Okay, um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to um, ease ourselves into the concept of a flange section. Okay, um, <coughs> specifically I'm talking about T-beams, but T-beams or L-beams or whatnot, it's the same idea. Okay, um, and so let me sort of take my time and explain what I'm talking about here. So what we've done up until now is we've treated each of the, the components of a building kind of separately. Okay, let's just sort of get down to brass tacks as to what we're talking about in this class. This is reinforced concrete design. So what I'm after is your ability to design in detail to make your components in a building. That's, we're structural engineers, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so if we're talking about building, what are we talking about? We're talking about really three things, beams, slabs, and columns, okay? That's really what a building is comprised of when we're talking about the building structure, okay? Um, and we're not done talking about beams and whatnot because we've got a whole host of other things that we have to talk about with shears and deflections and, and uh, oodles of other things that we need to consider. But I want to handle something a, a little differently uh, uh, for the next little bit, and that's looking at flange sections. See, when we looked at beams and slabs a little bit ago, we said, okay, um, I have a beam and I have a slab sitting on top of the beam. Well, I can design each of those independently, right? I can design the beam and I can design the slab. But what if it's like this? What if I cast the whole thing together where it's not just a beam and a slab independently, it's all one monolithic system. So the beams and the slabs are cast together, okay? Well, if I'm looking at each beam as if it was an individual unit, it's not a rectangle. It's not like this. It's a T-beam, okay? Because part of that deck is going to be considered effective in transferring load to the beam, okay? Now, basically what's happening is that a part of that slab is functioning as the flange for the beam. So, um, for those of you that are in steel design, you, you'll know that terminology um, uh, uh, by heart now, if you have like an I-shaped section, we call that the flange, and this part we call the web. So if you're looking at um, a monolithic floor system like this where the beams and slabs are all cast together, a part of the slab is going to function as a flange, and then the rectangular portion sort of serves as the web, and so you get this T-shaped cross-section. Now whenever you have a T-shaped cross-section, there's two questions that you have to answer. One of them is easy, one of them is tricky. Okay? The first question that you have to answer is how much of the flange are, do you consider? In other words, so let's say I have a floor system, and I'll draw, draw it out real dramatically. Let's say here's my floor system, right? And it, let's just say it just goes on and on and on. Let's say I'm looking at this beam. Okay, so how much of this slab do I consider effective for the beam? Is it that much? Is it that much? How much do I use? Okay, 
Um, if you start looking at the stresses in the slab when you bend the floor system, what happens is they kind of decrease as you get away from the slab. And, and I don't think that's that difficult of a concept to understand. If I have a beam support like right here and I stand on the beam, most of that load is going to go to the beam, right? As I get further and further away from the beam, the slab is going to experience less and less of an effect of my load on the beam. Does that make sense? So there is a point where you would sort of cut it off and you'd say, okay, that's what we'll consider effective for the slab. So how do you do that? Okay. Well, this goes into one of the another one of those empirical expressions I mentioned before. Remember how uh, I said a while back that sometimes we deal with concepts in structural engineering that are really, really hard to solve analytically, so we come up with these sort of shortcuts or rules of thumb to make our lives a little easier. Well, this is one of them. I mean, actually plotting out those stresses and determining their effectiveness, that's pretty complicated. It's, it's not a very easy task to do. I mean, if you wanted to try and do it analytically, you'd have to build this three-dimensional finite element model. It, it, it's a good bit of work. We need something simple, okay? So what we do uh, in ACI is we determine this width, okay? And so I'm calling this width here B. We determine this width B as the minimum of these quantities. And so I have two rules here, one for T beams and one for L beams. And what do I mean by L beams? The L beams are just the ones on the end, right? So if I have a floor system, you'd have L beams on the ends and it would just be T beams in the middle. Does that make sense? So it's just a, a pretty simple rule. So you would take the span length over four, this term BW plus 16 times H sub F, H sub F. So Think about it like this, B sub W would be the width of the web, H sub F is the height of the flange. So B sub W would just be this dimension, H sub F is that dimension, okay? So remember, I said this notation that I'm going to use, I'm going to be very, very cognizant of it, and so I'm doing the same thing here. So we take L over 4, BW plus 16 HF, or S, which is the girder spacing. Whichever one is the minimum, that's the one we use for our effective flange width. So that defines our geometry. And that's for T-beams, for L-beams, similar rules, just the constants are a little different. Again, it's pretty, pretty simple. Okay? But again, the idea is because as you get away from the beam, the stresses in the deck decrease. And so you have to pick a cutoff point where we'll say, okay, this is the part of the slab that we'll consider effective in transferring stress back to the beam. Make sense? Okay. That's the easy part. That, that's pretty easy because you can look at a floor system and compute that in five seconds. Here's the hard part. Okay? Now, to explain this, I got some images here on the board and I kind of want to illustrate this. Okay, let's start over here on the right. So, this is my best ability at drawing the three dimensional stress block approach that we've been using in uh, reinforced concrete design up until this point. So what do I have up here? Okay, So I have a singly reinforced concrete section. All right? So the top of the beam is experiencing compression, the bottom of the beam is experiencing tension. So how do I determine my tensile force? Well the tensile force is the area of steel times Fy. We assume that the steel is yielded, right? Okay, so what about the compressive force? Okay, well, the compressive force, we assume that this is a uniform stress of 0.85 Fc prime. It's going to be By, the width of the beam, and it's going to be AD, right? So it's essentially 0.85 Fc prime times this area right here, this shaded area, which is the area of that stress block. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, let's, let's, go, let's talk about this and make sure we understand that conceptually. Okay, so when you're starting out with a beam analysis, trying to determine MN and determining its capacity, the first thing that you solve for is A, right? Because you know what the area of steel is, you know its material parameters, you know what FC prime is, and you know what, what, how wide it is, you need to know what A is, right? Make sense? Now how do we solve for A? I've got C equals this and T equals this. How do I solve for A? What, do I, what principle do I use? The compression is equal to the tension, right? So I set these two equal to one another, and I say C equals T. I say 0.85 FC prime AB is ASFY, and then I just divide. Right? 
right? And then this, this right here, that was the formula for A, right? That it really wasn't much magic to it, right? Is, that, is everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, over here, so I just drew this in two dimensions, right? So this is the same beam, and this is my same stress block. Okay? Now, this, I know this is, I'm not, this isn't a trick question. What is the shape of that stress block? It's a rectangle, right? Okay, so now we're looking at T-beams, okay? And with T-beams, we have really two different options that could happen, okay? So here's my T-beam. Here's the cross-section. We have that, okay? Now remember, what do we do? We solve for A, okay? A is that magic depth such that the force in compression equals the force in tension. So there's really two options. Option one is that A could be up here. Right? That's one option. Okay, another option is my stress block, look, you know, here's my T-beam. Okay, the other option is that the stress block is, I don't know, somewhere down here. And so my stress block looks like this. Does everybody see what I've drawn? Everybody just kind of makes sense? Okay. We have names for these, uh, uh, these cases. This would be what we call a rectangular T-beam. And this is what we call a true T-beam. And whether or not it's a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam, is based on the shape of the stress block. It's either a rectangular stress block or it's a T-shaped stress block. Make sense? Now, if that makes sense, I want to go back over here and I want to ask you a question. What's the formula for MN for this? Last. I know you got an exam coming up, but you know this. Oh, come on. I'll start. They help me out. That's what Z. And what Z? D minus A half. There you go. Thank you. Exactly right. Remember that? Now, how, how did we come up with this formula? And you, you kind of alluded to it in your answer. We said a force times a moment arm, right? So what did we do? We said, we looked at this case over here, and we said, all right, this distance here is my moment arm. And as for the force, we could use either compression or tension, it didn't matter because compression equals tension. And so we got lazy and we said, well, what do I want to use? Do I want to use four terms multiplied together or two? Let's be lazy and use two. All right, is this bringing it back? Okay, here's my point. Whenever you're doing a moment analysis, all you care about is your stress block, your steel, and how far apart they are from one another. So this beam, when you're doing a moment analysis, that's all you care about. But here's my point. How is this any different than that? I mean, how is it any different, right? Rectangular stress block, steel. Rectangular stress block, steel. There's your moment arm. There you go. 
So I propose that in order to determine the capacity for this, it's the same formula as for this. But that's the one where it gets different whenever you have a true TV. Okay, that's the one where it gets quirky. So in order to assess this, we're going to look at both cases. I've got two examples where we're going to compute the capacity of a TV. One for a rectangular TV and one for a two, or, or one for a true. Now, I'm not going to tell you which is which, although you could probably figure that out. Um, <coughs> but we're going to go through it through and look at this. All right? So I have here a beam. This is a, 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 a T beam, and it's actually part of a floor system. Okay? Um, it's 4 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. We kept the, the, um, the material properties pretty straightforward. Um, what we've got here, though, is really some more information about the floor system than I have about the, uh, the beam itself. Uh, I did tell you that it's four inches, uh, it's a four inch thick slab. Uh, the effective depth is 24 inches. Notice how that's going to the center of the steel pattern, not to the, the bottom. It's six number nines, so the area of steel is six square inches. Now notice some, some notation here. B, that's the total out-to-out -out width of your flange. B sub W is the width of your web. Okay, so we're starting to introduce some new symbols here. Well, actually, let me take that back. I don't know that it's new symbols. We've actually seen B sub W before, but when we were looking at a rectangular beam, B and B sub W were the same thing because it's, it's all the same. <coughs> now, this floor system is 30 foot long, and I have here that the clear distance between the webs is 50 inches. That's going to become important later. Um, the main reason that I'm, I'm giving you this information is because I actually want to draw out what this floor system looks like so that you can kind of get a visual interpretation of what we're looking at. Okay, So bear with my three-dimensional art abilities. What's the... Oh, that's... I brought my mouse from my laptop. Why is it not working? Keep in mind, we're assuming this goes on, it keeps repeating over and over again. Am I doing all right? I think that doesn't look too bad. Okay. And so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And notice we got the same thing, you know, on each bar. Okay. Let's put on some dimensions here. So, let's see. This dimension to the center of the steel <clears throat> is D, which is 24 inches. Still defined the same way from the top of the beam to the center of the steel. We have this new term here, which we're calling um, H sub F, and that, whoop, let me get that pointer out of the way. Uh, that is four inches. <coughs> All right. Um, now, let me see. So, what else do we have? 
Okay, now we've got this term here. This is B sub W, and it's 10 inches. And then there was another term I gave you. I gave you the, uh, the clear distance between the webs, okay? And so what that distance would be is the distance from here to here, you know, between the faces of the webs. And that's 50 inches, okay? So right off the bat, I want you to help me out with something. What is the girder spacing? How far is it from here to here? 60. 60 inches. Now that's the girder spacing. My S's look a lot like my fives, so I tend to put the little you know, serifs on there. The little tick marks on the end of my S's just so I can see, okay, that's an S. That's just sort of my thing. You could write it in cursive if you want. I, I don't need cursive. Okay. And remember this system. You know, if you wanted to be technical with this part, you could say you could do something like this. And you could say that this dimension here is L, which is 30 foot. Okay. I just want to make sure that everybody understands the three dimensionality and I, and I actually think it's kind of a good exercise to draw this out just so you can kind of see it in your head. Okay. Now what we're now trying to do is we're trying to determine this sort of distance here, whatever this width needs to be. Because we're trying to isolate a single beam and analyze it. And so in order to do that, I fully define the geometry of the beam, except for one thing. Like, I know how deep it is. I know how thick the slab is. I know how wide it is. I need to know this dimension. I need to know this. Okay? So that I can begin the process of analyzing that beam. That makes sense? Okay. So now to compute this for a T beam, it is the minimum of the three following quantities L over 4, BW plus 16HF, or the girder spacing. Okay. Now, how long? It, well, tell you what. Um, what's the girder spacing? Let's let's work from the bottom up. What's the girder spacing? Sixty. Sixty inches. What is the uh, web width? Ten inches. Ten inches plus sixteen times what? Four inches. And what's the span length? That man right there got it on the nose. It's 360 inches. Inches, inches, inches. You need to convert that to inches. Boom. So 360 inches over 4. This is really important when you're doing this. It's really easy to mess something like that up. Okay. All right, so the minimum uh, of 360 over 4, that's 90, that's 60, and what is that? 16 times 4 is what? 64, so 64 plus 10 is 74, did I do that right? <laughs> 60 inches. So it actually did end up just being the girder spacing, just halfway over and halfway over. Sound good? Okay. All right. Now watch 
watch this. Okay. What we've got to do is we need to figure out whether or not we're dealing with this case or we're dealing with this case. So here's how I'm going to do this. Okay? <coughs> I'm going to determine the location of the neutral axis, and I'm going to do that based off of C equals T. Okay? Now, help me out for this T beam. What is T going to be? Is it going to be any different than it has been before? It's just going to be the area of steel times Fy. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Okay. All right. I know you got an exam coming up, but you know this. I know you do. All right. So T equals the area of steel times Fy. Now, compression, that's a little different. Okay? Now, for this beam right here, what was the uh, compressive force? It was 0.85 FC prime times A times B. Now, why was it AB? Like, why did we use AB? It's the area. The area of this, right? So, when we're talking about a T beam, we don't know whether or not the area looks like this or like this. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, for now, I'm just going to say it's 0.85 FC prime times the area in compression. I don't know what that area is. I'm going to figure that out right now. Okay? So we'll just, we'll just leave it like that. So would you agree then that if C equals T or 0.85 FC prime area and compression equals ASFY that the area and compression is ASFY 0.85 FC prime. Would you agree with that? That's, that's pretty simple, right? So, what was AS? I think we were using normal properties. <coughs> so what does this come out to be?
Now I want you to look at these numbers and somebody tell me what's going on here. It's not equal. They, they are not equal. This is a true statement. Now, <laughs> if they were equal, would that make it a case one? No, 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 no. <coughs> no. Can somebody else comment on that? It's case one. Why? Because area compression is less than the flange. That, that's the conclusion. That's exactly right. See, the flange has 240 square inches of area. Okay. In order to maintain equilibrium, you need a stress block that has 106 square inches. So that means your stress block is going to start up here and it's probably going to go to about right there. Okay. Which makes it a rectangular T-beam. It's not that they're equal. What if this number came out to be 305.88? Then the flange would, by itself would not have enough area to provide for the stress block. So the stress block would have to look like this in order to meet equilibrium. And then you'd be in a true TV. Does that make sense? So one of the things that you can do to figure out whether or not you're in a rectangular a uh, T-beam uh, scenario or a true T-beam scenario is to compute the required area in compression to maintain C equals T and then compare that with just how much area you have in your flange. And if then comparing the two you can see whether or not you're in a rectangular state or a true state. Does that make sense? Now, remember how I said that if you have a rectangular T-beam this and this are no different? Same story. All right. It's still a rectangular cross-section. So we can handle this beam now like we did the beams we've done in the past. So this is going to be pretty familiar. Does everybody have all of this? So watch this. So if we've got that, we can say that A is ASFY 0.85 FC prime B. Just like we've done before. So 6 square inches, 60 KSI, 0 0.85, 4 KSI. Now, what value do we use for B? Is it the 60 inches or the 10 inches? Exactly right. We know how wide the stress block is going to be. We're trying to figure out how deep it is. All right. Now, so this is 60 inches. And so what does this come out to be? One point seven six. I think I got like five seven six five. Yep. Very good on that. Now, I want somebody to comment about this value. Does this value make sense? It's less than H of F, so yes. Boom. There's another way to identify this a true T beam. The flange itself is 4 inches thick. The stress block is only 1.77 inches thick, right? In order for this to be a rectangular T-beam, the A has to be less than or equal to the HF, right? And so that value makes sense. It's another way of verifying what we're talking about, okay? So MN, so now we can just keep on trucking. MN is ASFY. D minus A over 2. So, what was D? 24 inches. And so what does that come out to be?
83, 22.3, second on the value. Yep. What are the units? Inch -tips. There you go. I wrote the I. I. And so converted to foot kips. Divide by 12. Six ninety three point five three. Say All right, sound good? Okay. Now, in order to determine our fee value, we need to determine the strain in the steel. In order to determine the strain in the steel, we need C, which is A over beta one. So 1.765 over what? 0.85. And why is it 0.85? Because it's 4 There you go. And that comes out to be 60 steel is this answer? 0.002. Well, for the for the yield strain, so the limiting strain would be 0 0.005. The previous code just used to use 0 0.005 across the board. The only reason that works, the only reason this 0 0.005 works is because it's grade 60. Sound good? Okay. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit here and I'm going to show you why. But first off, what's the formula we've been using for the strain of the steel? assumption here that this is 0 0.005. I'm just being lazy. Okay. This is the formula that we've been using for the strain of the steel. Now, let's just compute this out. Okay. So this is 24 minus 2.076, 2.076,
Never mind, I forgot to plug. That is a some that is some strain. <laughs> let me tell you. Point zero three two. Zero point zero three two. Did we meet? There was, do I have a second on that value? Yeah. Okay. Did we meet the limit? I mean, yes or no? All right. Hold on. Yes. 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 We met. Are y'all really that nervous about the steel exam coming up? Is that what it is? All right. So, does phi equal 0.9? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Now, so so our strain in the steel is greater than the strain, the limiting strain. So phi equals zero point nine. Okay. Now, um, so so first, first off, would you agree then that phi m n is just zero point nine times? 693.5 foot tips. And so BMN is what? So what is this? 624.2. Second. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, now here's the thing. It, it's a little unclear, but I actually kind of cheated just now. It doesn't really matter that I cheated, but I cheated. Okay, and I'm going to show you why. Okay, let me go down here to sort of explain this. Okay, what I did is I compared the strain in the steel against the limiting strain. Okay? But that's actually not the correct thing to do. The correct thing to do is instead compare the maximum tensile strain against the limit. See, the code says that you compare epsilon sub t, not epsilon sub s. And you're like, what are you talking about, Dr. Mike? What, what, I, don't, I don't understand. This might not be, be clear, but this is actually the first problem that we've done in this class where there's been two layers of steel, right? Remember I said, you know, when we designed, it was going to be all the single layers, all the single layers. So this is now two layers, okay? Let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, so here's the beam. Okay. And we have steel like this. Okay? So the steel is in two layers. So the center, the centroid of that steel is probably something like that, right? And then this dimension was D. Okay? Now, how do we do this? How do we use this strain profile, this 0 0.003 D minus C over C? Well, all that is is a similar triangles check on our strain, right? Remember, this dimension is C. That is 0 0.003. And that is epsilon sub s, right? But remember, I mentioned this a while back, and I didn't really elaborate too much onto it, but there is a difference between the strain in the center and the strain at the bottom. See, technically what we were supposed to do is compare the limit against that strain, not that one. So I kind of cheated because I used the wrong strain. But let's think this through. Did I meet the limit? Looking at the original? Yes, because I needed 
0 0.005 and I had 0 0.032. So I had more than enough strain. Now, what can you tell me? We computed this value. We didn't compute this one, but what can you tell me? It's bigger, right? So it doesn't matter what this is, because if that met the limit, we know this one is, right? So I kind of cheated. I didn't compute the right value, but it didn't really matter, right? Because of the answer. Now, if I got an answer on the strain that was, you know, the limit is 0 0.005, but I got an answer that was like 0 0.00499, maybe then I would go through and check the distance. And in order to do that, I would need to know how far apart those bars are spaced and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So I kind of cheated, but it didn't really matter. All right. Sound good? All right. Take the next 10 minutes. Relax, breathe. I'll let you out a little bit early. 10.55. I want everybody back. We have a celebration.